Good morning, St Mungo's. Uh, my name's Catherine, and it's lovely to have you with us this morning. I see that you have learned that this is the side to sit on if you don't want to roast in the sun, and we appreciate the sun worshippers on this side <laughs> who are enjoying topping up their tans whilst being at church. Uh, feel free to move if it just gets too much. That's perfectly okay. And if you're joining us on the live stream, then you're just as welcome to be with us this morning. And if we accidentally lose you, we will load up the service uh, at lunchtime so you'll be able to watch it this afternoon. I've been thinking as we're looking at this series about the names of God. And if you, were, if you missed it last week, we, the Ollie kicked off the series with looking at the name of Yahweh and how God introduced himself to Moses at the start of the book of Exodus. And today we're looking at Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. And I wonder what comes into your mind when you think about the Lord who provides. I've been thinking this week that sometimes my mind jumps straight to the things I'm hoping he's still to provide, or the things that perhaps he hasn't provided that I hoped that he would. But then I reminded of the verses from Psalm 100 that say, we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So perhaps I could think about the things that God has already provided for me. What are the things that you come into his presence with thanksgiving when you think about? So I've got three things that I've been thinking about this week just to get the ball rolling. And I, in a week that we've celebrated 75 years of the NHS, I am so thankful that he has provided a national health service for 75 years. And for the family members and friends of mine who have received outstanding treatment over the last, well, in my lifetime anyway, and long before that, I am so thankful that God has provided that for us. And I'm so thankful that he has provided me for opportunities to travel and live in different parts of this country and across the world, because that has shaped and changed who I am and helps me to be grateful for all that we appreciate where we live here in Scotland. And finally, I'm so thankful that he has provided for me the church families that I have been a part of in my lifetime. I was thinking this morning, I have been part of five church families in my lifetime, and that might be more or less than some of you. And each, they've been very different in styles of worship and the way that we have approached all sorts of different things. And yet they've all been communities of love that have pointed me towards Jesus. And I'm so thankful to each one of them. So as we come into his gates with thanksgiving this morning to a God who is a provider for all that we need, let us say a prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a provider for all that we need. Thank you that you are gracious and compassionate, that you hear us and that you take action. And God, we thank you for this church family and for our friends within it. And we thank you that we can come into your presence this morning and worship you. And God, we invite you here. We welcome you. We want to hear from you and we want to be transformed by worshiping in your presence. Amen. Let us stand as we sing our first hymn together, which is Holy, Holy, Holy.
just one notice to let you know about this morning, which is that our evening services resume this evening at 6.30 in Ladycroft in Belerno. Over the summer, we're going to be looking at the characteristics of God uh, from Exodus chapter 34, and Ollie is kicking off that series this evening. So please join us if you're able to. Let us continue with the words of the liturgy which are words familiar to many of us used across the nation and across the world as we just come into his presence and get our hearts and our minds stilled. And if you join in with the words that are bold and italics, that would be wonderful. O Lord, open our lips. Give us the joy of your saving help. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word and to seek forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand, so let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Let's say these words together. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you're able to, please stand as we continue together. Blessed is the Lord. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy. Great and wonderful are your deeds, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O ruler of the nations. Who shall not revere and praise your name, O Lord? For you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship in your presence, for your just dealings have been revealed. To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Oh, 
rises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord.
me in your love, bring me to my knees. May I know Jesus more and more. Come live. burning bush and he heard God call him. His initial response was, here I am, Lord. And then he remember that God told him to take off his shoes because he was on holy ground. And just that response of, here I am, Lord, you see it all the way through the scriptures. God initiates and then he looks to us to respond. Here I am. We saw it with Isaiah, with the boy Samuel. And Paul tells us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. I'm just going to encourage us to just use this song as an act of offering. And an invitation to God to fill you spirit I'm living. 
this. Lord, I pray you'd fill every heart. Lord, I pray you would give us willing hearts that respond to you, that gladly say, here I am. And Lord, that promise to rise is a promise of strength. Lord, I pray for those who need your strength, that you would come and strengthen them with power in their inner being by your spirit. Lord, I pray for this, this congregation that they would be marked by a longing to know you more and more. Lord, that they would be marked by the manifestation of your Holy Spirit moving in gifts, healing, evangelism. And Father, I pray your blessing leadership Isaac and Ruth and Catherine Lord would you do something new and fresh sing that again here I am here I am waiting Abide in me, I pray. Here I am longing for you. Hide me in your Come live in me and all my life. Take over. Come breathe in me and I will rise on heels. Come breathe.
I had while we were worshipping is of us standing on a beach at the edge of the ocean and I don't know whether the ocean is a place that you love to go or whether it's a place that scares you I just feel that God is inviting us on that adventure of a lifetime will it be easy <laughs> nope will it be comfortable not always Will it be the best life that we can live? Definitely. And perhaps there are some here that are standing thinking, God's not inviting me. I'm not worthy. We've sung about the holiness and the glory of God and we're conscious that we fall so far short. But that is the beauty of the gospel, that he calls the weak, the ashamed, the guilty, those that aren't normally invited, who are left behind. And he says, come, I want you. I chose you, I made you, I have created you in my image and there is no one more precious than you. Come and follow me, come out into the ocean where I will never leave you, never forsake you, I will be with you in every battle, every situation that you face. Any time you find yourself unable to see a way forward, he is the way maker, the promise keeper, the miracle worker, the light in the darkness. Lord, we just thank you that you are that God that sacrificed everything for us. And God, you are worthy of all of our praises, more than worthy. And we thank you for that invitation to us each and every day to live with you and to go on an adventure with you. And we say, yes, Lord. And he fills us with his Holy Spirit he equips us for what he has purposed for us. Every day, he fills us up. And God, we thank you that you are the strength that causes us to rise up and soar on eagle's wings. Lord, we want more of you today and every day. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Please take your seats. Thank you. Taking us into that place of worship that's so precious. It's Isaac next. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we pray for your anointing on Isaac this morning as he comes to speak to us. Fill him with your holy words and give us ears that are open and hearts that are open to hear what you want to speak to each one of us today. Amen. Thanks, Catherine. Now, something you might not uh, know about me is I'm not too keen on heights. Uh, I'm a lot better than used to be, uh, but when height is combined with a lack of control over a situation, like on a roller coaster or something, and my heart rate begins to rise. Now, one time uh, at university, I was at my college end of year ball. Uh, we'd had an amazing dinner. We were all dressed up nice and smartly. It was all very Downton Abbey. However, at this ball, unlike the kind you might see in Downton Abbey, we had the added bonus of rides, one of which was a Ferris wheel. Now, when you think of a Ferris wheel, you may think of a nice, romantic, slow-paced rotation giving you wonderful views over the grounds or wherever you may be. Well, 
When I saw this Ferris wheel, I saw a death trap. I saw something complete with high speeds, rocking seats, and very little stabilization. But my pride and my friends convinced me to join the queue. Now, the seats of this Ferris wheel were like ski lift uh, seats, like on the screen. And they took two people in each seat. And my one condition for going on this ride was that the guy that was, I was joining into this rocking nightmare of a seat didn't swing it. He promised. Now, as we hit the crest of the Ferris wheel, I looked down and I saw his feet begin to swing back and forth. And our seat started to swing madly, uncontrollably, perilously, back and forth. I was really rather terrified, totally unjustifiably, but still totally terrified. My friend had promised not to do that, and he had. Needless to say, despite my improved relationship with such rides, I'm never going to trust him around a Ferris wheel ever again. Promises are massively important, including to those like me who are scared of heights. And when a promise is broken, it will always have some sort of negative impact, whether or not someone gets in trouble for breaking it. A broken promise may lead to anger, distrust, Upset, loneliness, or just wasted preparations. But broken promises are by very nature harmful. So today, we are continuing to think about the names of God as we move on to the next slide. And I'm really excited for this one, as it means I get to speak a lot about one of my favorite people in the Bible. Uh, someone with one of the best names in the Bible, too. Isaac. But even more uh, excited uh, than that, I get to speak about Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. God will provide. A name we hear God called in the story of Abraham and Isaac, uh, Genesis chapter 22. So we've heard about a promise that was made to me. Uh, but as we think about God as provider, there's another story revolving around another Isaac that involves a promise and ultimately God's provision. So we're going to look at Genesis 22. So if you want to get your Bibles open, do turn to Genesis 22. But first, before we look specifically at that passage, we're going to get a bit of context about who this Isaac is. In Genesis 15, 16, and 17, uh, we see the initiation of the chain of events that lead to Isaac's birth. In chapter 15, Abraham is promised offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky, Chapter 16, we discover Sarah, Abraham's wife, has borne no children, and she deems that this is the Lord's doing, and so she tries to help things along the way, and this leads to the birth of Ishmael. But chapter 17 shows us that maybe this wasn't quite what God meant, uh, so to make it clearer, Abraham and Sarah are promised a son by God to be called Isaac. Then a few chapters pass again, Isaac is born in chapter 21, and after he's grown up a little bit, the scene is set for the events of chapter 22. So who here uh, loves celebrating their birthday? On oh, more hands than at the 845, that's very good. Uh, well, I, I love uh, celebrating my birthday and already counting down the days. Now, I hope by speeding through some of the chapters preceding Isaac's birthday, his original birthday, the day of his birth, it's clear that there'll have been a huge amount of excitement for his arrival into the world. Abraham was promised offspring as numerous as the stars. Now, I arrived into the world around two weeks late, and that must have frustrated my parents no end since I'm simply wonderful. Uh, but the biblical Isaac could be said by Abraham and Sarah's reckoning at least to have arrived many years late. Imagine then your birthday party being cancelled after it was promised to you. A big birthday, a big promise, and then it's cancelled after it was promised to you. And then more seriously, imagine the impact that God's command that Isaac, the child who he'd waited for for years, that God's command that Isaac is sacrificed. Imagine the impact that would have had on Abraham told by God to sacrifice his son, his only son, the son of promise, as it says in the Bible, the one through whom Abraham would father generations. How could such a command come from God? 
the God who promised Abraham he'd have many offspring through Isaac, how could it be possible that God would provide that now? I don't know what went through Abraham's mind when he was given this command, but it's not hard to imagine. He must have started being really wrenched inside, suffering hugely, questioning God maybe, questioning his faith, even his sanity in following this God maybe. I wonder if there's something Abraham might have had to cling to. And as I thought about this and prayed about this, I think there must have been. Firstly, because Abraham continued in faith. He even went so far as to take out the knife to sacrifice his son. You've got to ask yourself, why would Abraham sacrifice to a God who clearly breaks his promises, who at least it might come across as he thinks God clearly breaks his promises? Why would Abraham sacrifice to a God like that? Out of all the gods in the era, despite this request from God, Abraham still remained faithful to God, willing to give up his son. So there must be something that kept him faithful to Yahweh. Secondly, uh, if you look to chapter 22, verse 5, if you look down at that verse, it says, Abraham says to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. So from this, it seems quite clear, Abraham expected not only himself, uh, but also his son to return alive to the people they left behind. Despite there being no clue of how God could possibly be intent on doing this, on keeping his promise to Abraham, Abraham was still somehow certain that God was faithful and would continue to be faithful. And so Abraham, too, remained faithful. Whatever reason Abraham had to cling on to his faith, he remained faithful through his suffering. And he turned out justified through his faith as God provided an alternative offering, an alternative sacrifice. God provided. And so we come to the key verse we're looking at today where we see God called Jehovah Jireh. And that's Genesis 22. It says, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it said, on the mount of the Lord it will be provided. But why should we care? How does God being Jehovah Jireh relate to us? Now suffering of any sort is a terrible thing. Uh, we, when we suffer, we can face losing things we thought God had provided, and we can actually lose the things which we thought God had provided us with. This can leave us in the midst of great confusion, anxiety, pain, and suffering. Maybe we suffer loss of money. We lose our jobs. We suffer loss of purpose, loss of treasured possessions, loss of relationships. Maybe we can suffer loss of things we maybe even thought were indications of God's blessing on us or God's provision for us. Now, I know I've suffered through at least one particularly bleak time like this where I just couldn't understand what God was up to and I was absolutely torn up inside. Now, if you face this or you're facing this, I don't have any specific answers and I'm not going to try and provide them. But what I do have is a joy of faith and hope, knowing that God sees me, the creator of the universe sees me, and he provides. Knowing God sees me and cares for me and loves me, loves us so much that he provided his one and only son so we may have all we need, life in all its fullness, eternal life. Abraham, when going to sacrifice Isaac, ended up with God providing a ram, returning Isaac to his father. But when we suffer loss, we may see uh, what we feared losing, what we actually lost. We may see it return to us there and then. But I don't think that's the message of this passage, that God is provider, that God will always return what we lose, as much as I'd love that to be the case, at least in the near term. What we can learn is that if we have faith, God will provide. Even in the darkest of days, God will provide. God always keeps his promises. Now, the word provide in English uh, comes from the Latin, and the Latin literally means to see. 
So Jehovah Jireh can also be taken to mean God will see it. Spurgeon comments on this saying, our heavenly father sees our need and with divine uh, foresight of love prepares the supply. He sees to a need to supply it. And in the seeing, he is seen. In the providing, he manifests himself. And I think the perfect proof of this seeing, knowing, loving God is, in fact, even in the darkest of days that God has provided. So if we look at the story of sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis, in Genesis 22, verse 2, it says, God says, uh, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Genesis 22.2 again says, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. 22.6 says, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac to carry. Genesis 22.8 says, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And then Hebrews 11.19 says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide and he has provided. Maybe when we went through some of those verses, it reminded you of another story. Maybe it reminded you of John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Maybe it reminded you of 1 John 2 verse 2, where it says, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Maybe it reminds you of John 19, 17 to 18, where it says, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull. There they crucified him. Maybe it reminds you of John 1, 29. John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or maybe it reminds you of Luke 24, verse 6. He is not here. He has risen. God saw our needs, our sin, and he saw to it. He provided. God sent Jesus, his only son, as an assurance to all of us of his love for us. His son, not just to face death, but to actually die. Jesus died, gave his life willingly, suffering pain, humiliation, separation from God, as the guilt of all we've ever done that falls short of perfect was piled on top of him, perfect, innocent. God loves us so much that he suffered for each and every one of us. Jesus died that we might live in accordance with God's promises. And at the very start of the New Testament, we see Abraham and we see Isaac at the start of Jesus' genealogy. Abraham, who had faith to suffer extreme loss for the sake of God's command, and through this faith was blessed to have God's son, Jesus, in his family line. Jesus, the one who died to save us all, who showed such faith he actually went through, not just the prospect of, but the physical reality of pain, humiliation, and separation from God, and even death. Christ's death must have meant life seems hopeless for his followers. How could God's promised one, the Messiah, the one who will set us free, the Savior, come and die without challenge? How could God break his promise of this Messiah? Jesus was the Messiah, wasn't he? And like, like the disciples, even when we can't see it, we can know that God still provides. We can have faith. Because Jesus rose again in accordance with the scriptures and thus in accordance with God's unimpeachable character. God has power over death. God keeps his promises. God has power even over death. He can reverse even the most final and hopeless of situations we will face. And Abraham and Isaac are just a foreshadowing of Jesus, showing God had a plan from the very beginning to provide what we need. But what difference does it actually make to our lives? How can a God being Jehovah Jireh make a difference to our day-to-day -day lives? 
I'm going to quote a bit more of Sturgeon now as I think it hits the nail on the head. And I don't think I could say it any better. I believe that the truth contained in the expression Jehovah Jireh was ruling Abraham's thought long before he uttered it and appointed it to be the memorial name of the place where the Lord had provided a substitute for Isaac. It was this thought, I think, which enabled him to act as promptly as he did under the trying circumstances. His reason whispered within him, if you slay your son, how can God keep his promise to you that your seed shall be as many as the stars of heaven. He answered that suggestion by saying to himself, Jehovah will see to it. As he went upon that painful journey with his dearly beloved son at his side, the suggestion may have come to him, how will you meet Sarah when you return home? Having imbrued your hands in the blood of her son, How will you meet your neighbors when they hear that Abraham, who professed to be such a holy man, has killed his son? And we can do the same thing, can't we? We can ask ourselves, allow our reason to whisper ourselves when we're thinking, what's God doing? Allow our reason to whisper to ourselves, how could this possibly be life in all its fullness? How on earth will God honor this promise? What will my parents think when they find out I've become a Christian? How will society see me when I decide to live an openly celibate life? What will my friends think when they find out I gave up a huge salary to follow the Lord's call on my life? Spurgeon goes on to say, Abraham will have thought to himself, that answer still sustained his heart. Jehovah will see to it. Jehovah will see to it. He'll not fail in his word. Perhaps he'll raise my son from the dead, but in some way or other, he'll justify my obedience to him and vindicate his own command. Jehovah will see to it. This was a quietus to every mistrustful thought. I pray that we may drink into this truth and be, truth and be refreshed by it. If we follow the Lord's bidding, he will see to it that we shall not be ashamed or confounded. If we come into great need by following his command, he will see to it that the loss shall be recompensed. If our difficulties multiply and increase so that our way seems completely blocked up, Jehovah will see to it that the road shall be cleared. The Lord will see us through in the way of holiness if we are only willing to be thorough in it and dare to follow wheresoever he leads the way. We need not wonder that Abraham should utter this truth and attach it to the spot that which was to be forever famous, for his whole heart was saturated with it and had been sustained by it. Jehovah will see to it. We need to let our hearts be saturated with this name of God. Yahweh will see to it. He will provide. Now, that's not to deny the rawness and pain we can face, but it is to say God sees us in it and will provide. Now, the sacrifice of Isaac is one of the passages that can be pointed at, uh, and God criticized, how could a loving God ask that of Abraham? How could you follow a God that asks that of one of his followers? And then we see God provide it. The promised son Isaac did not die, but ultimately God's son, his only son, the son promised to us even longer than Abraham was promised Isaac, came and died. He himself was that lamb that died for us when we were on the brink of our own death. Abraham trusted God's character and believed God's ways were beyond our own. And ultimately in that we see Abraham and Isaac prefiguring Jesus and in Jesus' family line. So I urge us all to remain in faith throughout all, to cling on to our faith uh, as we uh, lose or face losing that with which we thought God had blessed us. To suffer in anger, sadness, frustration and confusion, yes, maybe, but to be so fully soaked in him 
so saturated with God, with the knowledge that he sees you and that he will see to it, that we can't help but trust God's ways are beyond our own and are good and perfect. To endure confident in the promise of our Savior God, our Jehovah Jireh, our provider God, the God who gave us his only son that we might live. To soak in the Holy Spirit here and now so much that we're literally drenched, dripping with him, living demonstrations of his lavish generosity, whether we face earthly poverty or earthly plenty. To be so soaked in him steeped in him, that whatever we face, the faith that he will see to it, he will provide, is quite literally dripping off of us. As the band comes up now, uh, and as you're able, please do stand as we respond. We're going to say goodbye to the live stream, and you go with our prayers I pray that you will know God as provider, God as Jehovah Jireh, that you know God will see to it.